old Mr. Peterson went to the doctor and learned he had only three months to live. At first he was distraught in a panic, so discouraged, what would he do? And then he had an idea. One by one, he began moving all of his treasures and valued possessions up into the attic. He told his wife, you know, I'm not going to be here much longer, and if I store it all there, then when I die can I, on my way up, I'll take it with me. Well, three months passed, and he was still around, and so he began to purchase more goodies and more stuff and more things, and he would slowly go up that ladder, put him in the attic. The wife would roll her eyes, kind of shake her head, but she couldn't deter him. There was an excitement about him, an energy, an enthusiasm. He actually looked forward to the time when he would bring it all up there. Well, after a number of months passed, sure enough, he died and the funeral service was held and the family came back to the house and the wife couldn't resist going up the stairs and looking in the attic. You know what? Everything was still there. So she said to herself, I knew he should have put it in the basement. All of us invest in what we believe will bring the biggest payoff. The truth is, if we could take one dollar and put it into one of these mega corporations, I could name a few and be guaranteed that it would turn into $10 million, we would grab every dollar we could and put it there. That's the way life is. And Jesus recognized this when he talked to his disciples there as he sat on the mountainside about where we put our treasure. And he put the choice before us, not between the attic and the basement, but between heaven and earth. And he noted that all that is part of this life is susceptible to decay and theft, to moths and rust, there's no such thing ultimately as financial security. It's an illusion and all the material goods, all the wealth, all the things we could pile up and collect. In our hearts and in our minds we know, as Job said long ago, naked I came into this world and naked I will leave. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In 1 Timothy 6, starting around verse 10, we're going to be content with food and shelter, for we brought nothing into this world, neither can we take anything else from it when we go. In our series, Keys to the Kingdom, we're noting 15 traits or characteristics that mark a genuine disciple of Jesus Christ. And nothing is more practical, nothing is more direct, nothing is more hard-hitting to you and me in our materialistic world where life is all about dollars and cents and size and accounts and things. Then what Jesus tells us will last. That cannot be stolen, cannot be destroyed, and cannot fail to bring the biggest dividend we could ever imagine. And so as a matter of faith, as we trust, as we hear, as we accept the fact that what Jesus said is right, we look at everything we do, not just on the Lord's day, but in our family and in our work and in our leisure time, not just with our money, but with our schedule, with our talents and our resources. And we say, where are we going to put it that it would do the most good? We sing about it in our songs. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Earth holds no treasures but perish with using, however precious they be. Some build their hopes on the ever-drifting sand. Some on their fame or their fortune on the land. 
Mine's on the rock that forever will stand. Jesus, the rock of ages. And as we sing those songs and hear the message of Jesus afresh, we're convicted, we're moved, we're challenged to look at our attitude toward things and life. We're going to talk this morning about two vaults, two lenses, and two thrones. The fact is, every one of us has treasure. That's not the question. It's what to do with it. The word treasure translates the Greek word from which we get thesaurus. You know what a thesaurus is? It's a treasury of synonyms and antonyms. It's a collection of valuable words. It's taken from this idea. Jesus talked in Matthew 13, 44 to 46, about a man who found buried treasure in a field. He sold all that he had so that he could buy it. He talked about a pearl worth so much that to that merchant he would let go of all the smaller ones he had stored and purchase that one magnificent pearl. There's so many scriptures that talk about this theme. If you turn to Luke chapter 12, there you see a man asking Jesus to arbitrate between him and his brother to be sure that he got his share of the estate. And the Lord's answer was a shock. Beware of greed. Even when a man has an abundance of possessions, that doesn't mean he has a life. And there was this farmer whose barns were filled to overflowing. He had more than he could store. Instead of giving it and sharing it and investing in a faith-focused way, he sought to enlarge his capacity. I'm going to tear down those little buildings and construct larger ones in me, I, my, mine for many years to come. And that night, his take, life was taken from him. And he was asked, who's going to get all the things that you stored up for yourself? Verse 21, Jesus said, so it will be toward everyone who is rich only in things and not in the things of heaven. Oh, Luke 12, turn there for a moment. Later in that same chapter, Jesus said, you can have money bags that will not wear out. A belt, a purse, a container, and there's no hole in the bottom. Ever have a hole in your pants pocket? Ever wonder what happened to the money you put in there? Jesus said, let me tell you, you can take something precious to you, sell it. Give the proceeds out of mercy. This is that word alms that we saw at the beginning of Matthew 6. When you give alms, do it secretly. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. It's from the word for mercy. And deposit upward based on something that you touch, something you control, something that you own. And this way, you can be sure it doesn't own or possess or control you. He's going to say in a moment, you can't serve two masters. Let's exhort one another to do something based on our faith with our spouses and our families. To look in our home at something we have. I'm not talking about junk or leftovers or things we don't use anymore but that which may be special to us because of what we paid for it and what it means to us. And take that item with your children. We're going to sell this. You can't, you can't sell that. Don't you know how valuable it is? Don't you know how long we've had it? Don't you know how much we play with it and use it? How much we need it? Let's take something just like that. And let's sell it. And let's take what we get for it and give it to someone that's poor, someone that's hungry, someone that's homeless. That's what Jesus said. And what a remarkable impact 
that we'll have on our gimme, gimme, gimme culture. And the fact that we're so accustomed to buying what we want, providing what our children ask for, how easily and to our own detriment we might ignore the clear teaching of Jesus. Sell something, give it away, and your purse will be fuller than it's ever been because there are no holes in it. Turn with me now to 1 Timothy chapter 6. You know the passage, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. The teaching so easy to preach for me, so difficult to practice regarding contentment. The truth that pursuing after money can cause us pain and anguish and great loss. And then later in the chapter, remind those who are rich in this world to be generous and to share, to be rich in good deeds and to lay up a good foundation for the life to come. And there's a warning to Timothy and to all of us that our vault in which we make our deposit from which we believe the greatest interest and dividend will come is a heavenly vault and not a physical one. The scripture does not treat wealth as sin. In fact, in our Man Up group, we've been reading in Proverbs where it says if you're lazy, you're going to be poor. If you're diligent and industrious and hardworking, you'll get rich. Nothing wrong with that. Throughout Scripture, you can see the truth about property that we handle and we manage. But the Bible always couples that with stewardship, that the owner, the possessor, the one who controls all of it is the Lord himself. So 1 Timothy 6, we could start at verse 6. Godliness, that's what brings the great gain. Invest in that if you want a big return, especially with contentment. I don't have to have something else. I don't have to do that or go there or buy that. I'm secure in my relationship with God, and what He's given me is enough. Verse 9, those that want to get rich can fall into temptation, a snare, many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. A fellow preacher that I've known for many years in the Middle Tennessee area began going to the YMCA. And I don't know how it started. He's a good man, good preacher, loves to sing as well, but... He would find a, a car in the parking lot where he'd go to work out, and it was unlocked. And there's a little cash on the seat, and he, he decided to take it. It wasn't much, but his pocket. Down the road, he'd start finding checks, and he would forge a name or a credit card. He'd go and begin to use it. He was found out. What did you think would happen? He was arrested. He went to prison. He lost his family. He lost his job. He lost his ministry. He would have thought prior to that, it won't happen to me. I love God. I'm serving God. I'm not going to fall into some foolish and harmful snare. I don't love money. I just need a little extra here and there. Verse 11, flee, flee, flee from these things. You want to invest? Look at verse 11. Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, gentleness. These are the vaults. Secure, permanent, eternal. Now down to verse 17. If you're rich, by the way, we're all rich by some standard. Don't be conceited. Don't fix your hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. You want to be truly rich? Look at verse 18. Do good. Be rich in good works. Be generous and ready to share. You want to store something up? 19. The treasure, there it is again, thesaurus, 
the great value, a good foundation for the future. You want to take hold of something, life indeed in Jesus Christ. It's ironic, but what we give, we keep. What we keep, we lose. Jesus said the one that wants to preserve his life can't hold on to it. And the one that lets it go for the sake of the kingdom of God, it's his forever. And so every time I give, every time I refuse to pursue more material stuff, I become richer. I become more content. You see, the, 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 the solution for contentment is not more stuff. It may be less stuff, but it's certainly the attitude I take toward the stuff that I have. I wonder if we have any Monopoly players here today. I always enjoyed this game as a child. Did you? And it's a good game. I don't disparage it. I had fun with it until my brother bought all the property. Charged me rent on every hotel. And bankrupted me. I didn't even know what the word monopoly meant. It meant get it all. My favorite part was I got $200 just for passing go. But it all depended on the next car you drew. And now, as an older man, I admit it, I look back and I think, is that what, game, what life is about? Running around... Drawing cards, buying hotels and properties, and bankrupting your brother. Now that last part is tempting to me. <laughs> and nothing in the game about what's beyond, about what lasts. So a few hotels come and go. So some money comes and goes. Story is told of a Texas rancher bragging to the old boy from Tennessee about all he had in that direction and all he had in that direction and in that direction and in that direction and the Tennessee boy said, what do you have in that direction? It's a good question. No matter whether you're from Tennessee or Texas or any other part of the world, it's the one Jesus leads us to ask. Well, there's some ways that we invest in heaven. If you help other people get there, when you talk to them about Jesus and about the Word of God, about the promise of eternity, if you divest yourself of some stuff and use what you receive for His purpose, we talk about compounding interest. I want to be more interested in spiritual things, don't you? I want to let it multiply so I can't even tell how it might grow. I, I want a trust fund. I want to trust God and I want others to be able to trust me. I want the highest rate of return, the 80-20 rule. I want to put my strength in that 20% of life that brings 80% of spiritual prophet. A lot of stuff I can do, you can do, even as Christians. Have you identified your work in this local church that you're here to accomplish? I want to diversify ministry, mission. You know, it's exciting. The men's prison work officially launches today. I want mutual funds. I want to partner with you. Let's put what we have together spiritually for the kingdom of God. I want a bigger portfolio. I want to take what God gives me back and reinvest it. I'm talking about not material things, but that which outlasts it all. I want to consult with my broker. He has a plan. I want to do something based on my faith. I want to show my family how to invest. In fact, anything I do that will last for eternity, that's putting treasure in heaven. Let me ask you, when you die, when I die, what will die with us and what will go on? You've heard that poem, a hundred years from now it will not matter what kind of car I drove, how big the house was, what clothes I wore, but that I made the difference in the life of a child. And that's an example of that which outlives us and outlasts us. Your heart, 
your treasure. You can't put one here and put one there. You can look at your treasure and wherever your checkbook indicates it goes, that's what's important to you. That's what you're interested in. That's what you want more of. And wherever you put your heart, your resources will follow. You know, the teaching of Jesus is so simple and so powerful and so amazing. And what he said stands the test of time. Let's think for a moment about two lenses. The eye is the lamp of the body because it's through the eye that light comes in. And what we perceive and what we understand and the steps we take are all dependent on what comes in through here. So if my lens is good, I'm full of light on the inside. If it's bad, I'm blind. I'll walk in darkness, I'll stumble, and I'll grope, and I will fall. Light and darkness, a continual truth found in the Word of God. Oh, we saw earlier in chapter 8, if your eye causes you to sin, using that metaphor, that powerful image, that's the impact the eye can have. Hebrews 12, let's run, let's fix our eyes on Jesus. Here are three passages, or four, that mention seeing the unseen. One of my favorites is in Hebrews 11, when it says that Moses, having led Israel across the Red Sea, endured as seeing him who is unseen. Noah built the boat because he was warned of things not yet seen. These all died in faith, having seen the promises. How how do you see a promise? How do you see the invisible God? How do you see what hasn't happened yet? You do so with an eye that's healthy, that's focused, that brings light into the soul and into the life. And so we choose that eye what we see and and how we see it and what we do with it. And so this commitment, I'll set no vile thing before my eyes. Jesus warned about the lustful look. Job made a covenant with his eyes that he would not look at those whom he should not look at. And then two thrones, two vaults, two lenses, two thrones. No one can serve two masters. And then he uses the word love. Serving and loving go together like heart and treasure. They can't be pried apart. The one that I serve is the one that I love. The one that I love is the one that I serve. And it may not be a who, it could be a what. If I love myself, I serve myself. If I love money, I serve money. And it becomes my master. If I can get the love right, the serving will take care of itself. And whatever, whoever I serve, that rules me and becomes my master. When Jesus spoke of hating money, couldn't he have said, use money? Be careful about money. Don't let money occupy and rule your life. Couldn't he have said, did he have to say, hate And this word despise, to treat as of no value, that's what the word means. To look down upon something strong. And you can say, well, these are intended to say, compared to our love for God, 
Like elsewhere, when Jesus says, hate your father and mother, we understand he means that you love the Lord so much. It's as if you hate all others. And yet the words are so powerful in this key to the kingdom that you and I want to ask ourselves, do I hate money? Do I despise it? One of the things we might look forward to in heaven is there'll be no money. We'll never run out of it because it won't be there. We'll never be consumed with it. It won't be part of that eternal existence. I'm looking forward to that, never having to think about it again. When Jesus said you can't serve God and wealth, your version may say, instead of wealth, mammon. This was an Aramaic word. It comes from a Hebrew root that means to trust. And originally it meant that in which a person trusts. Interesting that it would then be applied to money, that as the language developed and changed, what do you trust in? Money. And so mammon, the thing you trust, became a synonym for material goods and wealth. And then especially that which was gained dishonestly by a ransom or a bribe. In Luke 16, Jesus talked about that dishonest manager who used the funds available to him, actually his master's funds, to make sure that when he lost his job, he would have a home beyond. That's the only point Jesus is making. He's not commending the man for doing anything wrong, but simply for being clever enough to say, hey, I've got this money. The best thing I can do is to use it so that when this chapter is over, I'll have a place to go. Two vaults, two lenses, two thrones. Investment, it's a key to the kingdom. It's the question for you and me. It's not whether we're putting it in the attic or the basement. It's whether we're putting it up there. What about you? Is there a response you need to make to Jesus Christ as he talks about what counts and what matters and what lasts and what's worth putting our resources into? Does that address a need in your life? Does that challenge you to refocus and love and serve just one master? If you today are ready initially to say, you know, the treasures of this life, they're not going to endure. I want to put Jesus Christ on in baptism. I want to find the riches for which he gave his life and for which he rose again. I want to repent and be baptized. We can assist you. If you have another need, won't you come? Let's stand and sing this invitation song.